Thank you for the introduction. I think it's also worth adding that uh, it's the first time I give such a presentation. So yeah, I'm a bit nervous to be honest. Uh, yeah, but the topic uh, is anyway, I think is very important uh, because it's, uh, yeah, it's actually like uh, when Artur uh, proposed me to make this presentation and uh, yeah, he said like you can choose the topic that you like. Immediately, immediately I thought of uh, actually what makes a good design. Uh, uh, what are the ways that we can somehow reduce the number of mistakes that we make or some other people make that use our code, and also um, how can we work more effectively? So, what are the tools, tips, or tricks that can help us? So actually, that's what we're going to discuss today. And I'm very much interested to hear uh, what you think about all of this. Uh, yeah, so I think we should, uh, yeah, I would really appreciate if we can discuss it afterwards. Uh, so it kind of consists of two parts. Uh, so the first part, part is about the intuitive design of the way, that's the way I call it. Um, and the second part is about uh, how can we optimize our workflow and just more get more things done within uh, yeah the same amount of time? Uh, yeah, then we have uh, some conclusions and then hopefully some Q and A. Maybe I hope you will have some questions. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, so, what makes a good design? And to start, I would like to. Uh, even think about not only about the code design, but just design in general. For example, if you start using some new application and you've never seen it before, uh, like what is what is the first thing that, uh, how do you go about actually using it? Uh, and I would like to tell a small story. So when I was working on my first uh, company, um, yeah, there was this, uh, change of the like the style guides. So we were supposed to use some new application and they gave me a very strict requirement, for example, that uh, I should make the QML diagram to, uh, well, yeah, to basically describe the architecture so that, so that I can later propose it to uh, yeah, other people and they will make some remarks and stuff like that. But, this requirement was very specific that I should use exactly this application. So this might not be the architecture that I was creating, but it's the same application. And the thing is that I spent probably like maybe up to two hours just trying to understand how to add simple blocks, like just simple blocks. Um, and then when I realized it and uh, when I learned how to add new properties, how to create connections. Uh, even after actually knowing how to do this, it was still quite problematic because um, I realized that I have to do a lot of clicks. I have to change here, but uh, here the focus doesn't stay. Then I have to go to another window. Then I have to add something. And that was just a nightmare. And it was um, kind of so unintuitive that I ended up just switching to another application. Um, and this, this specific application is called, is called Jrovo.io. Um, and the thing is that at, at that point, I didn't know anything about this application either. Uh, but immediately when I opened it, um, five minutes later, without even really, really reading really any documentation, I was able to create some uh, basic blocks to add the connections, to add the properties. And probably like half an hour later, everything was done. So I spent more time uh, with the first application to just like try to learn how it's supposed to work and how uh, get around it. Uh, then I spent with application that I find more intuitive to actually get the job done. And in my opinion, uh, something very similar happens to uh, to the way we write code and the way we 
use code that is already written. Um, let, let's consider some very simple, silly example. Uh, there is a class. It is very uh, generically called manager. And let's assume that there are already some standard methods like constructor, destructor, all of that. Um, now let's say that there is a setter. And this setter has a comment. So it, it expects some kind of uh, pointer to an interface. Uh, and the comment says that this class takes ownership of the handler. It's very good that they said it because, for example, if uh, I didn't see this comment, and for example, I created something, I allocated the memory, uh, and I provided this class here, uh, but then I might assume that actually I should be the one uh, yeah, cleaning afterwards. So it might happen that this class would delete um, yeah, the entity. And then I will also do the same. Uh, but let's consider this example. Uh, so here you can see you, you still have the same comment. Uh, but the function itself is a bit different. It says that it expects the unique pointer to the handler. And so that kind of already tells you, even if you didn't read any comments and documentation, um, it already tells you that uh, this class kind of expects to take, take ownership of something. And so it is easy to ignore uh, some comments or it's easy just not to read them, uh, but it is much harder to uh, like dismiss the compiler error. And that's actually my point. So I would like to make another example. This, uh, these examples, they are quite uh, like theoretical. So, um, but afterwards I will have a real example. So just be patient. Um, imagine for example, if you have some global resource um, of which there should be only one instance per application, but you accidentally made it possible to actually copy it. So I know it looks strange, it looks like just a simple mistake, but let's just assume. Uh, so you just forgot it, you made it copyable. Uh, let's assume that somebody actually, uh, and that, that there was an issue that someone accidentally made a copy. And then as they were assuming that it's a global resource and there is only one such instance uh, at a time. And they were changing something, but they didn't see, but it didn't actually affect anything. And then they discovered that they accidentally made the copy. So as a result, there were two resources, but there should be only one. Uh, if you assume that this actually happened, we can improve this example by, for example, uh, explicitly deleting the copy constructor in copy assignment operators, or what is even better, just to make the constructor private altogether uh, and provide some static uh, like access function. This way we pretty much have control over, over the construction. And so such mistakes should not happen. Uh, now, now an interesting story. So yeah, it was like a couple of years ago. Um, so I made a mistake and yeah, uh, as you might guess, since a couple of years passed, but I still remember it, then it was quite, uh, quite challenged and it was yeah, not very funny, but uh, now it looks funny. Uh, so just to, exp before explaining the example, I'd like to uh, show you what, uh, yeah, just a small like introduction. So let's assume that there is a method which accepts a uh, char pointer. So it's like the old school, the C, pure C code. So it expects a pointer to a null terminated string. And what this class does is that it expects that this uh, string, it's actually um, some path. So for example, like the drive C, then there's like program files, stuff like that. Uh, but it replaces the double stashes or the triple stashes with just a single stash. 
So let's assume that this function already exists and it works as intended. Uh, now let's uh, let's see this. So the whole idea of the feature that I was working on was that uh, when application crashes, um, we would like to not only like have a crash dump, but actually uh, create some uh, text file that would contain all the basic necessary information. So for example, um, when exactly did the crash happen? What is the, where is the application located? Uh, what's the memory usage when it crashed and stuff like that. Uh, so a part of this story, I had to, uh, I had to get access to some um, environment variable uh, that contained paths. That's why I use this function. It is called get and uh, it is actually a real, real existing function. Uh, so I use it to retrieve some environment variable, and then I pass it to that function, which uh, yeah uh, replaces those stashes. And can you already see what I might have done potentially? Okay. Uh, so this is the documentation. Actually, the key point is right at the bottom. It says return. Uh, returns a pointer to an environment, environmental tab, table entity containing a word name. It is not safe to modify the value of the environmental variable using the return pointer. Uh, so my mistake was that I simply didn't read the documentation carefully. Uh, another, like the general mistake I made was that uh, I'm got, I got used to working with C++ code, but this was um, yeah, mainly C because I was making changes to quite an old part of the application that was written probably like uh, before I was born. Uh, yeah, the project was like uh, 30 or 35 years old. So yeah, uh, but can you see that the, actually this function, it returns the uh, non-const pointer to non cons data. So yes, I shouldn't have modified it. And that indeed created quite some problems because it, because it crashed randomly and it crashed not immediately after, uh, yeah, like modifying it, but just sometime after. So it was quite a pain in the ass for other people to actually find what the problem is, then find the person who actually wrote this and only then like assign it to me so that I can fix it. Um, and of course, my mistake was that I didn't read the computation carefully, but it returned non-const pointer to non-const data. So I shouldn't have modified it, but I could, and I did that. I did it accidentally, but still I did it. And that's like my entire point of this, uh, of what I'm trying to say. So my point is that developers use API in the same way as the end user use the application itself. Uh, if something is not forbidden, someone at some point will misuse it. It's like having a monkey with a grenade in a room. It's like, doesn't immediately mean that the monkey will do something with the grenade, but it is quite possible. So they, they will do it at some point because they can. So just a few, key takeaways. Um, you can understand well-designed code and how it is meant to be used even before you read a single comment. Um, it is also hard uh, to use such code in the wrong way, uh, but it's easy to use it in the right way and it sort of guides you in the direction of a good solution. Um, yeah, comments can be ignored, the compiler errors are not. And it's much better to figure out how can you write something? How can you come up with a good solution that um, that doesn't mean like writing a long comment that you should use it this way, not that way, but actually make your architecture in such a way that uh, it kind of guides, guides people into using it the right way. And also the good design imposes only the necessary minimum of restrictions on the person who will be using it. Because if your design is, uh, or your architecture, you may call it, uh, if it's very rigid uh, and yeah, it doesn't like any changes at all, then it's not good either. 
Now let's talk about metrics. Yeah, just kidding. Uh, yeah, another topic that kind of not exactly relate to design, but I still wanted to mention it because I think it's very important. Uh, and I have an impression that, uh, yeah, that I have an impression that people quite often think otherwise, especially like non-developers, but actually like uh, managers, uh, product owners who didn't work with the code in the past, so they don't have such background. So uh, consider the long-term life of your code. Um, is it set up as a solid base for future expansion or extension, or is it already built on compromised and kind of set up to become a technical depth? Uh, now a small quote, technical depth is the term used to describe the cost of reworking a solution in the future. Uh, usually because a simpler approach was chosen to save time. Uh, choosing a better solution takes longer during the original implementation, but it results in less code depth. Um, the point I would like to make is that it's better to look at simpler solution, more like if it's the last resort. If there is like no, pretty much no other way. Um, the entire project is based on such decision, decisions, just on different level. And if you make compromises and shortcuts, especially at the early stage, um, it's not good. Uh, it can, yeah, it already looks bad. And in the definition of the technical depth and just this short, uh, simpler approach, I actually, I don't really agree with it because uh, the simpler approach was chosen to save time. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually reality. Because uh, although this approach might feel simpler and that it might save time, uh, if you look at it like in the wrong, in the long term, uh, it is neither simple nor does it save time. It's actually the opposite. So consider the classic scenario: uh, you write the code uh, by taking a shorter path uh, just to get the result, to get it working, and it works. Uh, but there is a catch. It will probably be quite a bit more difficult or almost impossible to extend or uh, extend such architecture when new feature requests come. Uh, at this point, it is no longer simple. It actually becomes difficult. And at some point, you will also start to consider refactoring your own code because actually that's uh, how you, yeah, that's how you resolve a, yeah problematic code, you refactor it. At this point, it is not only more difficult because it's difficult to rewrite a code than to write something just from, from zero or from nothing. And um, it means that at this point, it is neither simple and it does not actually save time because in the end, it forces you to spend more time on actually refactoring the code. Uh, the high quality well written code doesn't just make it easier to read and maintain, but it also improves the stability and it, it leads to fewer bugs. Uh, errors will be easier, easier to trace and uh, resolve. And what is also important is that more good developers will be actually interested in working on such projects because uh, let's be honest, uh, no one is very excited to work on, on a project that kind of uh, if you read this code, you realize that it's full of compromises, full of uh, to-dos, or <laughs> how some people call it, it's smelly code. Um, the only exception that I can think of uh, to this rule is the MVP, so the minimum viable product, uh, where based on the result, which is expected within a very short time frame, uh, people will be making decision whether it's something worth investing in, further or if the entire this part of the project should be just dropped entirely so this is kind of the only scenario when i can think that uh, yeah, choosing a simpler approach just to get the results uh, kind of makes sense so some just like a summary uh, i think it's very valuable to think about the long-term life of your code so not just something that you write now uh, and it works but what will happen to it one year later? Uh, is it gonna be like a burden for the project? Will it make, uh, make it, 
yeah, hard to upgrade. Will it introduce some tight coupling problem when if you want to change something, uh, you have to also change something else, and that's uh, it's very pain in the ass. Um, also acknowledge that simpler approach is almost never actually simple in the long run. So it might uh, you might feel like during that specific day you spend less hours working on that particular task, but in the long run, and that's what the project is focused on, because projects, they do not typically last for a couple of months, and then they're gone. Um, yeah, usually the companies, projects, they last for years. So the code that you read uh, right, right now, and even though you might think, okay, I will rewrite it, um, quite often something that you, you commit, it just stays that way. <laughs> Uh, so be careful. And if you absolutely have to do a workaround, uh, please make sure that um, it is sort of separated from the rest of the code. Uh, also provide some comments because it's very useful, uh, not only explaining uh, what is happening, but actually perhaps if you already have ideas how this can be improved in the future, also write in the code. Because for example, if uh, if this is an, this is the part of the project where people want to improve on. But for example, maybe a couple of years after you will not be, you will no longer be working on in that company or in that project. And uh, yeah, probably it's not very uh, like, yeah. In Ukraine, you have this phrase like, um, which means like you want to be remembered at least well, but yeah, it's not like, uh, and not like when you find someone using blame in the code, and then you can see that this person is no longer working in the company. So write some extensive comments. I think people will really appreciate. And just in general, try to do your best to write good code. You and other people will thank you later. Uh, and this is when we actually move to the second part. But actually, I would like to listen. Maybe you have something to say. and some thoughts that you would like to share? Anyone? Like, what do you think about uh, the long-term, short-term approach and actually about the making sure the design actually kind of tells the user of that design. So also another developer, uh, what's the good way to actually use it and uh, reduce the chance of some bugs or unintentional use. So uh, I have a thought about uh, long term. We see short term. So, mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to develop my own library, and the thing is that I was uh, that much afraid of long term stability of this, and having like easy uh, uh, API as friendly as it possible. So. Basically, right now I have only three or four files in that library. It mm -hmm. actually, this library actually does nothing. However, this repository with this library was created like half of a year ago or a year ago. Mm -hmm. So my 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 thought is that uh, maybe uh, it's not about like short or or long. It's more about um separating the code implementation so um whenever we have some problem we are and we are not quite sure if we can solve it so mm -hmm. we need some proof of concept and this proof of concept with time becomes the prototype and prototype goes in production so in this case it's i think it's inevitable so we will have it in production in any case because the product owner doesn't see and does not want to pay for some code refactoring if he do, didn't solve any problems with it in the past. Yeah. And I think like if we have some structure that uh, for the project that allow us um, more or less easily change the places of the code for example models we can like write some proof of concept try to use it uh, at least the i think like if we have um, 
pretty straightforward API for this module. It's not a problem what is under the hood. If it, it's a uh, short-term uh, implementation or if it's long-term implementation, we can like uh, change it anytime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do agree that it's, uh, yeah, it's very, yeah, like having a good API is already like the must help. So it's the first thing that uh, another developer or perhaps you in the future, you interact with. And you're right that, for example, the actual implementation can change. So if someone writes, uh, yeah, perhaps something um, hastily, like very fast, just to get some proof of concept working and just to have something to show to the client. Uh, if you have a good API, um, yeah, you can ch change the implementation. The only problem would arise if uh, you realize that you have to change the API a lot. <laughs> uh with the new like if at some point uh, you actually go into refactoring yeah uh, basically that was the reason why i mentioned if you like have the good api the problem with long term and short term can be solved like by uh creating this api and change the code under the hood like and do not affect other parts of the code however yeah it's pretty hard to determine api yeah yeah you have to be very like forward thinking you have to know the future uh, but i agree that actually probably like the api is like uh, in the order of importance probably good api is like even before uh, above um, like the actually the long term or short term um yeah i agree but i think it's important to add uh, that whenever we use a short-term decision, uh, we increasing we are increasing our attack depth. Mm -hmm. So we also must manage it. Yeah, I agree because uh, it kind of comes down to development habit or perhaps some procedures that the company has. So, for example, if uh, if you go for something that is uh, a workaround or sure some simpler path. Uh, it is very valuable that it is actually somewhere written. So for example, that you, uh, I don't know, have a file in which you keep track of the backlog. So you, you add uh, some kind of this task. But you don't know, you might know, don't, you might not know who or when will be actually doing this, but I think it's uh, having such backlog and having a list of such, I don't know, compromises or just tasks. Uh, kind of helps you to determine or to track your code depth because uh, if you don't do that, then you actually it's hard for you to realize what's the uh, in what condition is your project. And it's actually like the code depth is an interesting story because it's kind of hard. Um, like for example, if I imagine that you're a client and you just want to get things done, but uh, and so you hire a new software engineers, they they go through onboarding, they start working on the code. And at some point they, they leave, and like you hire new people and they also the same thing happens. And it's like, if if there is, if a level of code depth is very high, I feel like the project becomes almost uh, like too rigid, like too, I don't know, solid. So it's not very extendable. So yeah, it's an interesting topic, I think. Yeah, actually, like, okay, I can see that we already spent half an hour. <laughs> I wanted to share a very like um, recent example that I had to negotiate with the client to allocate more time just to make a good proper solution because, uh, and he didn't want to do that. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so I kind of had to argue that um, it wasn't even like it will work either way. It was like. It most likely will not work unless we dedicate a good amount of time to actually um, get it done. And I convinced them, although it took quite some time and it took quite a few conversations. And I already implemented it. Now it works, but now I have to convince the uh, like the platform holders that that's the good approach because they can still say that no, no. So like for me, it's very like uh, 
recent and big topic. I want, I want to add something um, yeah. from my experience. It's, um, it's very hard to, to say to a salesperson or to a um, uh, stakeholder that it needs refactoring, so I avoid them. Uh, the, way, the way I try to do refactoring, because it's very hard to hit the right design from the beginning. Uh, requirements changes, uh, uh, you don't see the whole picture. And, and even if you do apply to a lot of design planning, etc., it's it's challenging to keep design um, upfront and create it from the first time. So refactoring is really big important uh, topic here. And in order for me to do a good refactor, uh, what I do is is I want to have the confidence to refactor. And the way mm -hmm. I achieve that is by writing tests. I'm writing. I'm tr I try to write test-driven development. I write the tests. Um, I try to use less mocking, and I try to, of course, uh, separate the concerns all the good things I try to do. But the most important thing is that we have to be able to refactor with confidence and not be afraid to change something and then. Um, not knowing the system works. The test give me that confidence that I, I can change. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, the test also helped me with the API because when I first write the test, I know how I want to use the API, like a custom. So that that is what helps me. Yeah, I think you made, made a very good point that uh, having a good test coverage is also very important. Uh, yeah, it's important just in general, but especially when we're talking about perhaps taking some shortcuts because the client wanted to get something as, far, as fast as possible. Yes, I agree. It's having good test coverage is very important. Yeah, with, 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 the, with the, as fast as possible. Yeah, this is uh, something that I try to avoid. And the only, I, I, what I tell to the client is the only way we can go fast is by go well. If we don't go well, in a few months, if you want to change something, it will be very, very, very hard to change. It will take a lot more time to change that. And in, in a year, it is going to take a lot of time to change something good up on your feature. So this is what I'm trying to communicate with the clients always. Not always works, but I try to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly actually my point. So that's exactly the kind of conversation I had to have like recently. And um, yeah, I will have to, yeah, while working on this presentation, I also, also work, was working on another presentation just for the stakeholders to like present, present my idea, present, show them that it's working. And then yeah, hopefully they will, um, yeah, not try to convince to go for the simpler approach if the better approach is already implemented. Yeah, but I agree. Um, yeah, so I think, actually, I thought that it would be, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, so this second part is uh, actually quite um, shorter. It's just some tips and tricks that I've learned uh, about optimizing your workflow. Um, it might seem very obvious or silly to you, but uh, I, I think it's very useful still to mention them because um, I don't remember actually someone telling me about this, but uh, when I only started like going to development, but if they did, I think I would be, yeah, I would spend much, I, I would be just, I would be working much more effectively. Uh, so one of the things about is about the shortcuts. So especially in the IDE that you're working on, working in like the, Xcode or Visual Studio if you're on Windows or uh, Visual Studio Code, which I think is both on Mac and Windows. Um, yeah, just having your shortcuts and getting used to them. Uh, because like uh, switching between the header and the CPP or opening the, uh, like the definition of something. Um, yeah, and just many, many others. And also, uh, having shortcuts and uh, just knowing them by by heart um, outside the application, uh, outside the IDE, I mean, uh, just some shortcuts to, I don't know, uh, quickly navigate your window, your windows, or just 
uh, you pretty much do anything because at this point you can, uh, there are tools, there are applications that allow you to pretty much do anything. For example, on Mac, I use this tool. It is called Better Touch Tool. Unfortunately, I think it's only available on Mac, uh, but perhaps on Windows, there is like some uh, alternatives. So for, for example, um, it allows me to, for example, for example, for example, uh, to have uh, to save uh, shortcuts that I like or that I'm got used to it. Uh, save it uh, in some configuration file, and then when I, for example, set up a different uh, machine, a second laptop, um, I can just import those shortcuts, and immediately they are working. So I don't have to go to uh, Xcode then find every uh, shortcut uh, and find how they call it and then change to the shortcut that I got used to it. And then, uh, yeah, if someone, yeah, if I have to replace my laptop or if I also have set up uh, a different, a second laptop, then I have to do it again. Um, yeah, actually uh, having such, just using shortcuts in general is very useful. And even having some application that is uh, that allows you to save and just import export them and apply them is I think it just saves a tremendous amount of time. Uh, the second thing is about the study code analysis tools. And now I know that it's not a C++ code, although it's a presentation about the C++. Uh, yeah, it just yeah. Of course, I, I cannot uh, show you the actual code for my project because I would probably get into trouble. So those are the, just the screenshots that I uh, found on the internet. Uh, yeah, I think using the static code analysis tool is just incredibly valuable because it can immediately give you some very useful remarks um, about how, what can you improve. And that's actually like very early on. So it's not like you make small change, you compile, you make another change, then you compile again. Uh, study code analysis tools allow you to do that just way faster. So um, just like give it a try. Like if you don't use it, just uh, at least give it a try, try it for a couple of days. If you find them uh, annoying, not useful at all, you can of course just like turn them off, remove them and anything. And yeah. Um, yeah, also if your current project that you're working on, it, if it enforces certain code style guidelines, as it probably should, so like the uh, number of spaces, parentheses, uh, stuff like that, uh, try to see if the IDE allows you to kind of automate that. So for example, you can tell the IDE that they should, uh, I don't know, remove trailing white spaces. If, uh, for example, you have a project and there's a linter which for example wouldn't even allow you to uh, build the project on the build machine if uh, there are like white spaces or stuff like that uh, yeah try to automate such things because it is ridiculous for the software engineer to just uh, spend even like i don't know 10 or 15 minutes of his day just like typing spaces or tabs whatever you prefer uh, or moving parentheses from one line to another. That's that's not what the job of the software engineer is. That's like that's really ridiculous. Um, you can do you can even go one step further and actually use something that is called C lang format. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Uh, on one of my projects where um, you know, where I've been working, we have we started using that at some point, and it was like uh, I don't know heaven. In the sense that um, we used to leave and then have to fix a lot of remarks, like literally uh, move your opening bracket to the next line or move it to the back line uh, or move the pointer um, yeah, pointer symbol uh, closer to the type, not to the actual name of the, of the variable or just, yeah, just small stuff like that. And just leaving that in the comments and then having to fix that, it's, uh, again, it's just ridiculous. And so, for example, a C-Lang format, what it allows you to do is to simply, uh, you create a file in which you define your standards. So code standards, they exist just because code style uh, standards. They exist just so that uh, 
uh, all code or at least most of the code inside your project, it looks pretty much the same because if you go to each file and it looks different, it's just, it's very confusing. Just it's harder for people to read. Compiler doesn't really care about such things. Um, and so c -Lang format allows you to create one file which defines the style guides. So it says that it, it has to be like four spaces. There has to be like, um, I don't know, anything, but almost anything pretty much. And then it automatically formats your file into that, like just as you can see in this animation. Uh, so you can write something and it just automatically formats. It adds spaces where they have to be. It removes spaces where there shouldn't be spaces. Yeah, just give it a try or yeah, if your project starts using that, I think a lot of people will, um, yeah, their lives lives will be will become much uh, better, easier. Um, one more thing is that, for example, we have in our project actually that uh, requirement that uh, there should not be trailing white spaces. So, like, uh, um, if you type a couple of spaces after the actual code, and you commit that accidentally then the builder will not even start compiling because it will detect that you have white spaces it will ask you to remove them and it was so annoying that I actually uh, I added a special shortcut uh, that ran a small script that for example if I uh, instead of just going through the file and removing like I don't know uh, spaces in like 10 different places in one file then five different places in another file I can just select the entire file press the shortcut and that's done. So you can even automate uh, stuff, so things like that. Uh, now just to come up, uh, come back to my first example about the application that you find useful and most convenient to use. Uh, so just please use them because if just someone tells you to use a very specific application, but there is no reason to actually use exactly that. If you know that you can do things better, if you, know that you uh, yeah, you already know something uh, very well, you got used to it, it's pretty much almost like a habit and you can get things done inside of that specific application very quickly and you don't have to learn a new application, which is not necessarily better. Uh, then please try to use that. For example, we have uh, this portal, the link is uh, yeah at the bottom, where you can request some applications. Um, also, you can yeah consider talking about your client that, for example, you like to use this uh, small application in your project. It will make you way more productive. I think it wouldn't be a big problem for uh, yeah for them to just provide it to you. Or just consider using uh, like if it's a paid application, just investing into it yourself. As long as it's not really um, problematic for our um, like help desk people because if it's something that for some reason is I don't know forbidden to use in our um, in our laptops then for, of course you should probably not use it but in general try to uh, find better tools and use the tools that you are most comfortable with another problem is just I don't know it's it's so funny that it's almost not funny. Um, for quite for most of my life, probably I got used to Windows, and I got used to changing languages between mostly English and uh, Ukrainian. Um, I got used to using just the Alt Shift, but the funny thing is that macOS it does not allow you to do that. There is literally it is a system policy that you are not allowed to use what they call modifier keys just to change your uh, language. And I found one application that actually allowed you to do that. But uh, yeah, later on, this application was bought by a company uh, and then they just stopped developing it. But uh, the original develop developer was not allowed to make any changes because he no longer had rights to the application. They stopped updating it. So it was, it was dead and no longer working in the most recent versions of macOS. So at some, at some point I tried to like, uh, yeah, change, um, change it to a different shortcut and then got used to it. But then when I switch back to Windows, it is still, again, muscle memory. It's like, it doesn't work. 
So I decided just to write a small program myself. Just a small program that starts when my laptop starts. It just, and when I press the shortcuts that I like, it actually changes the language. I spent probably like uh, a couple of hours just to write it uh, outside of, of my working hours, of course. Uh, but it was like, uh, I don't know. I was very, I was, I was very help, happy when I actually uh, wrote this. And it's actually not only useful for me, but actually when I, uh, I just posted it on GitHub because um, yeah, my, my friend, he, he also like bought his first uh, Mac computer and he asked me like, how can I change the language? It's he, because he cannot do it. And I started laughing. I said, told him that I had to write a small program to, that allows you to do that because Mac OS does not allow you to do that. And he asked me if I can send it to him. And so I decided just to post it on GitHub and imagine just how happy I was when I actually uh, accidentally saw that someone uh, on Apple forum, they asked them if it's possible to change the language using the, um, yeah, like the Windows style shortcut. And they sent them a uh, link to my GitHub. I don't know, I was so happy at that moment. I just I just wanted to share like with you. Uh, so I can see we, yeah, quite a bit over the time that I said initially. Uh, yeah, another th small thing is that uh, please write scripts. If you find yourself that you're doing something again and again, uh, think it can be if it can be optimized. Uh, optimized uh, if you can write a script that will do it for you in just like uh, a few clicks i think it will and then you can also share it with other developers and i think they will be very helpful because if you use if you're using some scripts already it was written by someone and yeah those someone they're also like people like you so if you find something that you're doing again and again it's annoying it takes uh, time just consider writing a script for it uh, yeah and think about all of this as kind of a loop so for example if you if you're doing something in a loop no matter how small that task is uh, when the loop repeats again and again and again uh, the cost the cost of that small task it can actually increases and so what i'm suggesting you to do is to actually uh, in your real life not in a code, like in your real life, try to uh, take that small task and move it outside the, of the loop by creating a small script or um, yeah, just even creating like a small application. Maybe that's a bit overkill, like creating a small application to get something done. Uh, just please try to identify those small things that you do repeatedly uh, every day and then think how can you um, how can you optimize them? How can you spend less time doing exactly the same thing? Uh, yeah, one another thing is that it's something very cool. I, I noticed that there's a thing called Copilot. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, I think it's mainly targets like uh, the JavaScript and Python, but I think it's they either um, about to add C++ support or they uh, have already added it. I'm not exactly sure but so i think the future of programming is behind the ai assisted coding so uh, if you use some like uh, third party extensions to your uh, ids like visual studio or xcode actually i'm not sure about the xcode uh, like uh, visual studio code or uh, visual studio and for example you might uh, get used to for example if you write uh, a definition in the header and then you press just some shortcut and immediately you have the, uh, like the actual implementation in the CPP file. And that's very nice, convenient, small thing. But imagine like if you, if you call a method like set something and then you press a shortcut just to, and it creates a implementation inside uh, of CPP file. But imagine if it actually contains the, not only like the, um, yeah, just not around the implementation, but the actual implementation. And so I think in the future when AI, perhaps in some down way, uh, tries to give you suggestions, for example, if you start typing for loop, yeah, maybe for loop is uh, a bit too simple. I think we have it already. 
but my point is, I think, uh, uh, again, something that is very repetitive and it can be optimized. I think it will be improved. It will be optimized in the future. And with the help of uh, just very simple AI, some net, uh, neural networks, uh, it can be done. And actually the guys from the, um, it's like Elon Musk founded company. I forgot how it's called. It's like open, open AI, I think that's they, the one who created this, but I think GitHub bought it uh, afterwards. So try to use, try, just try it. Like it's called Copilot. I think I will share my presentation afterwards so you can take a look. Um, and yeah, this is it. And just two more tips and I'm done, I promise. Uh, so the psychological trip uh, tip, try to reduce the context switching as much as possible. So we can do only one thing at a time at any given moment. So switching between tasks very often increases your mental workload. Uh, while you are not actually getting more things done. You get the same amount of work done, but with lesser quality. So please just don't do that. Another thing is that please take a small breaks during your work because it increases your uh, focus when you actually return to work and increases your productivity. But by taking a break, it means going for a small work, or preparing coffee or doing yoga, meditation, anything. Uh, however, if you're just sitting, if you just keep sitting in the same place, but watching YouTube instead of like writing code, it is not a break to your, uh, to your brain. It actually feels like just the same work. So don't do that. Uh, please take some breaks. Uh, so some key takeaways, identify the small and repetitive tasks that you, that you do every day, and then think, how can you optimize them? Uh, explore the large amount of tools that already exist that can automate your workflow and just make your life easier and yeah, better. Um, invest at least a little bit of your time into writing some scripts or just Googling how to, um, how can you more effectively do something that you already do, but perhaps not that effectively. Um, so simply put, just trying to find more uh, straightforward and fast and just better solution to do your everyday work. And also please take breaks and limit context switching. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, thank you for your attention. What, what do you think? Okay, I assume that everyone is like so in awe, like so surprised <laughs> or yeah. Yeah. What do you think about all of this? Like, do you think that tools are important, uh, or if writing scripts uh, is an overkill? Thank you very much for the presentation. It was it was awesome. Um, really enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, it's very important for me to if, if I have a repetitive loop class to write something that can help me because even something small, as you said, can take. With time to take a lot of a lot of time. Yeah, thank you. It was it was awesome. Uh, I learned yeah. a lot of uh, new things. And good job with the with the GitHub app. Yeah, thank if you. I switch thank to Mac. Uh, if it's, if I switch to Mac, I, I, I will download. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was I was thinking. Yeah, thank you for thank you. And uh, yeah, I was thinking like maybe adding. A, uh, a link here would be an advertisement of spam, so I didn't do it, but yeah. Wait, or did I? Okay, I think I did it. I did add it at the, at the bottom. But yeah, I hope I hope that it was useful to uh, yeah, to at least to some of you. And if you took at least a couple of like it's not takeaways, so make some conclusion conclusions, and you will uh, hopefully can apply them in your the everyday life and hopefully uh, make your work easier, more effective, more pleasant, then uh, it would be very nice. Uh, yeah, nice, nice for me just to know this. <laughs>